Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Web 101. Today we're going to start talking about HTTP, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. So as all of the pieces that we're going to talk about here, uh, HTTP is kind of an oddball in that it's not a language, it is not a specific thing that lives in one place. It is the glue that binds the servers and the clients together. And it's one of the pieces that kind of I think about a lot when you talk about the web. Because to me, HTTP really gets to the heart of what the web is. And it's the internet. It's the connection and the network effect. The ability for so many different types of clients to talk to so many different types of servers. And the protocol itself is fairly approachable. Um, the specifications for it are readable. They're very dry, but they're not impenetrable if you want to just go ahead and read the specification. And it really has, I think, because of its simplicity, uh, helped to have the web essentially kind of take over the internet. When you think of the internet today, people just assume you're talking about the web um, and web technologies. So that's what we're going to start talking about today is this hypertext transfer protocol and sort of where it fits into the ecosystem of um, the web. So what is uh, HTTP? It's a, a very basic concept. A client will create some sort of request, send this request uh, across to a server. The server will process this request, figure out does it need to do something? Uh, does it need to add or remove something from a database? Does it just need to find a file locally and send that back to the client? At the end of the day, the server generates some sort of response and sends that back to the client. The requests are usually pretty simple. Give me this, put this here. The re responses can be wide and varied. Uh, text for an HTML page, JavaScript for running some code, images, streaming video, binary data, all sorts of things can come across is, as part of the request. So this request response loop is essentially what is covered by HTTP. So once you create a uh, communication socket, the, and you do that socket over um, port 80 usually or port 443, port 443 is really more used these days because that's where the security happens. Um, so uh, everything that's encrypted it happens on port 443. Um, port 80 was the unencrypted, unencrypted port. A lot of our examples I will do in port 80 just because dealing with the encryption on some of the command line tools is really tedious. But know that like any of your browsers and anytime you'll do this sort of for real, you'll be using HTTPS uh, and going over port 443. The instructions themselves are just basic text instructions using simple verbs like get, put, post, delete. Um, there's a couple other ones that you know, head, connect, options, trace. Um, there's a bunch of other ones that you'll encounter very rarely. There's a bunch that I didn't even know existed until I went and looked them up in the specification because I've just never encountered them in, in sort of day-to-day -day life. And then there are optional headers, and this is just any additional information that you want to send along as part of your request to the server. So if we think about what a very basic HTTP request would look like, it's just two lines of text. Uh, the first line is just a verb, get. Um, this has to be in all caps, so G-E-T, and then what you want to get. Uh, it could be as simple as just slash, give me the root of this particular resource or website. And then the protocol that you want to use, either HTTP 1.1, you might try one, uh, and then there's also HTTP 2, which we'll talk about at the very end. That also has to be in all caps. And then after the first line, you've got any number of header lines. There's only one header that's required as part of the HTTP 1.1 protocol, and that is the host header. So this is essentially telling the server what uh, website or web host you want to request this resource of. This allows servers, a, a single server, to return information for lots of different websites. So you would just have host, colon, and then the name of the site, example.com. 
It's not a full URL, so there's no HTTP here, there's no slash index.html or any resource paths, it's just a host name. So that first line is called the start line, and it's just a verb followed by the resource, followed by the protocol version. After that, you can have any number of header lines. Like I said, the host header is the only one that's required by the HTTP 1.1 protocol. And then at the end, you have to tell the server that you're done sending the request. And the way that HTTP says you, you do this is by sending two uh, carriage return line feed sequences in a row. So it's just two new lines right after each other. Um, a carriage return new line is technically a backslash n backslash r. Uh, most servers will just accept a single backslash n, which is just um, a line feed or a, an enter key. Um, and uh, yeah, most servers are not super picky about it, but the specification does say you're supposed to do it a specific way. Speaking of the specifications, we talked about a bunch of things. The, the verbs have to be in all caps. Uh, you have to have two line feeds at the end of your request. Um, how do we know all of this for certain? Is it just something that I heard from somebody who taught me how to do web stuff? Is this something that you just hear from other people on the internet? We actually know this because we have standards, and we have really good standards these days, especially on things like the HTTP protocol, but even for HTML and CSS and JavaScript. So the HTTP 1 standard, 1.1 standard, um, is defined in RFC 7230 on the Internet Engineering Task Force website. So if you go to um, uh, tools.ietf.org slash HTML slash RFC 7230, and I'll have all of these links in the show notes, so don't worry about having to write stuff down. Um, you can actually read what the standard says about line feeds. Although the line terminator for the start line and header fields is the sequence CRLF, any recipient may recognize a single line feed as a line terminator and ignore any preceding carriage return. So uh, recipients in this sense are the servers, what's receiving the request. And this is just sort of the language of the HTTP specification. So you can... It's really not too bad to go read as specifications go. So I mentioned that the start line is case sensitive. Uh, it's kind of interesting what they've decided to make case sensitive and what not. The, the start line is pretty um, critical, though, in that it contains that HTTP verb. Uh, you really need to know what you're requesting. So the, the case sensitiveness of the, the URI path, so, you know, slash or slash index.html, and then the protocol, HTTP 1.1. So if I were to lowercase the get, if I had lowercase get, for example, and I sent that as my request, the server is going to respond with a HTTP error code 501. It's going to say, I don't know what this is. This is not implemented. Similarly, if I lowercase the HTTP in part of, in the start line of the request, the server will respond with a 505, HTTP version not supported, saying like, I, I don't know what version this is, but it's not one that I recognize. I only recognize capital HTTP slash 1.1. Now, because the host line is one of the headers, it is not case sensitive, and the headers in general aren't case sensitive, um, and your particular server or application may treat the values of them differently but most servers treat everything um, the same. Uh, I, on the back end, they probably either lowercase or uppercase everything for comparisons. But in general, you can send weird camel cased versions of host. Uh, your example.com can have all sorts of weird capitalizations in it. And the servers will respond with, you know, a good old 200 saying that's just fine. So let's look at some of this stuff in um, a command line in sort of like a raw form. Um, there's a lot of command line stuff that you'll end up doing on the web, so it's probably a good idea to get familiar with some of the command line basics. Uh, I'm on a Mac. Uh, I'm most familiar with a Mac. I do know that Windows exists, and many, many people use Windows, so I will definitely try to give Windows examples for as many things as I can. 
just know that I will not be able to go into as great detail on the Windows side of things as I can on the Mac side of things. So on the Mac side of things, you will want to make friends with the terminal application. So in your Applications folder, you can go into the Utilities folder, and in there will be a program called Terminal. And we will be using that uh, off and on throughout the series, so um, sort of get acquainted with that. In general, and this is true for both Windows and, and Mac, uh, command line are text commands that you type out after a command prompt. So you once you open up Terminal or PowerShell, you'll see some sort of command, si command prompt. It might be a greater than sign. It might be a dollar sign. It might be a little tilde. I'm not sure what you know the various terminals have. But you'll just start, being, start typing stuff out. The first piece that you'll type out is going to be your program name. Um, so the first program that we're going to play around with here is called Netcat. And it just allows you to open up a raw TCP socket to a particular server on a particular port. Uh, once you type your program name, you'll type a space. And then you have program arguments. These are uh, extra pieces of information that you're passing into your command line program. So for our Netcat program, which is abbreviated just NC, we're going to type in uh, dash V. And that just specifies verbose mode to Netcat. Otherwise, Netcat is very silent, and you don't really know what's going on. So you have NC space dash V space. Then you'll type in the host name, so example.com here. Then another space, and then the porty, the porty, <laughs> the port. In this case, it's going to be port 80. So once we type all of that in on our terminal, and we hit Enter, we should start to see some stuff. So because we hit the dash V in the command line, we'll see something that says connected to example.com port 80, succeeded. After that, we can just start typing our text out. So we'll do get slash HTTP 1.1, hit enter, host colon space example.com. And then we have to hit enter twice because we need to put two carriage return line feed sequences in there. That will end our request. And because computers and internet are pretty fast these days, almost instantaneously after you hit enter that second time, you're going to get the response back from the server. And it's going to respond with something that looks like HTTP slash 1.1, 200 OK. And then there's going to be a whole bunch of headers coming in as part of the response. Things like cache control and content type, date, expires, cache hits. Um, eventually, you're going to get two more carriage return line feeds saying, I'm done sending headers. Now is the actual content of that request. And that's where you'll start to see the HTML from this particular request. So if you had typed all of this stuff out, the, the first couple of lines are not part of the request response. So this is just us typing stuff out on the command line and getting um, some text response from the local Netcat server. Those first three lines that you'll see are going to be the request that we sent. So our start line, get, and then the one header we're sending across host, then uh, one blank line or two line feeds to end our request. Then we'll get a bunch of stuff coming back from the response. And uh, that has similarly two sections, a header and, and a body. On Windows, this is going to be in PowerShell. Um, I could not find a tool like Netcat that's um, built into Windows. There's lots of people who have basically written little PowerShell programs that emulate Netcat by creating raw TCP sockets and doing stuff with them. But I didn't want to really talk about stuff where you're going to have to do a bunch of extra work. So the next sort of thing for sort of examining web requests is, well, what if I don't want to do a quite so raw um, request? then Windows and PowerShell does have a really nice utility called invoke web request. Um, and so you can just type out invoke dash web request, but they also abbreviate it IWR. And this one's a little bit simpler in that you just type uh, invoke web request space. And then in this case, it is an HTTP, uh, or I'm sorry, a full URL. So you're going to have HTTP colon slash slash example.com. So you're going to have the protocol and you're going to have the host. And you could actually request you know, uh, 
you know, slash index.html or slash images or whatever. But we're just going to do HTTP uh, colon slash slash example.com. When you hit enter here, PowerShell is going to execute that request and print you a nice sort of summary of the response and it'll it actually re returns this little like object if you capture it in a variable you can examine it in detail but if you don't capture the response it'll just print out a bunch of stuff to the screen it'll print out the status code it'll print out the body it'll print out the raw content of the response um, it'll have a section for just the headers so you can see all of the information about the response the one thing you can't see with this particular command is uh, the request headers. There's not really a way with uh, invoke web, web request command to see the full um, request response loop. But you do get an awful lot of information about, about a request, and it's still a really useful tool. Something very similar to invoke web request on the Mac and Linux world is curl. So this works relatively similar in that you don't have to worry about ports. You just type in curl space dash v space and then your URL http colon slash slash example dot com. Hit enter and it will say, hey, I'm trying to connect to a particular IP address. It's going to say some stuff. I'm connected. And then because we added the dash v in there for verbose mode again, we're going to see the request headers as they go across. So we'll see the get slash http slash 1.1 host header example.com um, curl sends a couple other headers it's going to send an, a user agent header and an accept header just again additional information that's being sent to the server and then after that you'll see the response come back from the server we'll see our http 1.1 okay we'll see you know cache control age content type all sorts of uh, other information coming back from from the server and then at the end of the headers, we'll have our two lines again, and we'll start to see the HTML of the actual page. So curl will send a little block of text. You actually see this with greater than signs sort of pointing to the right saying, hey, this is what I'm sending. And then there'll be another block with less than symbols sort of pointing to the left, indicating, hey, this is what I got back from the server. There's another really great tool out there called Postman. Um, and this one's really nice in that it's fully cross-platform so that um, what I could show you on Mac works the same as on Windows. And it's really great for examining HTTP requests. Uh, it was focused on um, REST APIs, which we will definitely talk about later. But it's just a really broadly useful tool for examining HTTP requests in all forms. So it's a GUI tool. You download it from postman.com and it's, you know, got facilities for saying, hey, uh, here's very similar to um, curl. You just type in a URL that you want to get. So uh, HTTP example.com. Um, you can specify the, the HTTP verb that you want to get. So you can say, uh, I want to send a get request or a post request or a put request. There's a place that you can specify any additional headers that you want to send. So maybe you want to send uh, application uh, type. You could send content type. You could set, um, I don't know, any other types of headers that you might need for your particular request. For basic things like just, you know, looking at example.com, you definitely do not need to set any other headers. You also notice that you don't have to set the host header because Postman is smart enough to know, hey, I'm using HTTP 1.1. I'm going to send the host header. And then there's a whole nice section for getting the response, uh, examining the headers in detail, examining the uh, body of the response. It does all nice color coding and formatting of the response. It gives you a nice little section to say, hey, what was my return line status going to be? Is it going to be 200? Was it 300 something? And in fact, if you mouse over the little statuses, it gives you a little description of what that HTTP status code means. And it's really nice. Really, the only annoying thing about Postman is that they've kind of switched to they they want to make money and they want to switch to some subscription stuff and they make the download kind of hard to find. If you just go to postman.com, it's hard to find it. So I would recommend just going directly to postman.com slash downloads and you can grab a copy of the client and you don't have to sign up for anything.
Uh, and then last but not least, you can examine requests in a browser. Now, you're not going to necessarily see uh, all of the request and response headers, but very similar to Postman, you will definitely be able to get a good sense of all of the response headers. Um, and you can just get this by opening up pretty much any browser, Safari, Chrome, Firefox. Right-click on a web page and look for the Inspect Element um, option in the, in the drop-down. Once you're in the Web Inspector for that particular browser, there should be a Network tab. And depending on your browser, it might be empty when you first open it. You might need to refresh the page. A lot of the inspectors only list the items uh, after the inspector has been opened. So open up the inspector, load up a web page. You'll see a list of all of the requests that have gotten made for that particular page. If you click on any one of those requests, uh, the inspector will bring up a nice little detailed view of, hey, here's a bunch of details about that particular request. So let's talk a little bit more about the response that we get back from a web server. So that the response is going to come after you send those uh, to carriage return line feed sections, and it's going to consist of a response status line, and that's going to say HTTP slash 1.1. So it's going to you know return to you. This was the version of the protocol that, that we've both agreed on that we're using, um, and then it's going to return a status code and um, a message sort of for you to read it. So you'll see something like HTTP slash 1.1, 200, OK. And 200 just means, yep, you asked for this thing, and I got it to you. And then after that response status line, you're going to have any number of response headers. And these are just going to be uh, a word, and then a colon, and then some sort of value. So it's essentially a very simple key value pair. And you'll see things like age, cache control, content type, um, what server this came from, X cache hits, content lengths, all sorts of stuff that, that the server wants to send back to you, the client, that it thinks you might need to do stuff with it. And then after that, you're going to have two more care to turn line feeds, and then finally the body of the request itself. So this is what you asked for. Since we asked for example.com slash we're going to get back a HTML web page. There's a lot of different response statuses that you'll get. We talked a little bit about some already. So we've talked about 200 for OK, 501 not implemented, 505 versions not supported. But there are a whole slew of them in uh, five different brackets. So you've got um, the 100 error codes, 200 error codes, 300, 400, and 500 error codes. Um, and so we'll go through those uh, a little bit here. Uh, 100s are, I don't know that I've ever encountered them or used them. There's 100, which just means continue, and 101, switching protocols. 101 is pretty much only used these days with HTTP2 because a lot of times the browser isn't necessarily sure that the server supports HTTP2. And so in the initial request for something, it will also pass the line a host header saying, hey, if available, I'd like to upgrade to HTTP2. And then the server will either respond with a 200 and HTTP 1.1, basically ignoring the request for the upgrade, in which case the client has to be able to understand that and be like, well, all right, I asked to see if we could upgrade to 2, but you couldn't do it. If the server can, it'll send back a uh, response header of 101 with HTTP2 saying like, yeah, I can do HTTP, let's go ahead and upgrade. The client will then resend the request to that server again using uh, a new start line with HTTP slash 2 as the protocol. And from then on, the server and the client will communicate over HTTP2. So the 200s are sort of the everything's working good. 200 OK means you asked for something, and I found it, and I gave it to you. Um, there's also 201 for created. This is if you send something like a put request to say, I'd like to put this on your remote server. Then the server could respond with, OK, you've got the right credentials. The thing you sent over is good, and I can store it, and I'm going to send you back a 201. I created that. Uh, 202 is accepted. Again, similar things. A lot of these I find used more in APIs than, you know, certainly with web browsers. 
and there's also 204 no content. Um, I'm not really sure exactly. I've never really used one of these, but I, I could imagine a situation where you just want to tell a server something and you don't really need the server to respond with anything. So that server might respond with just a 204, uh, okay, whatever we communicated about worked well, but I don't have anything to give you back. There's the 300s. This is your stuff is not here. Your stuff is over there. Um, and so you've got 301. This thing you asked for lives over there and it will always live over there. It has moved permanently. Um, if the client is smart enough, it might actually upgrade its thing and say, oh, well, in, instead of asking for, you know, foo.html, I'm going to ask for, um, you know, blue.html from now on. 302 is moved temporarily. This is a little bit different in that the server saying, look, you asked for something and you should keep asking for that thing in the future. Right now, it's not here. It's someplace else. But in the future, keep asking for it because it might move again. Um, so don't update what you're requesting. Um, 303 is see other. Uh, in practice, I have not encountered this. Um, almost all of my redirects are 301s or 302s, but I could envision a situation where as a server you said something like, look, you asked for bananas. I don't have any bananas anywhere here, but I've got this apple over there which might be something similar. So you might see, you might respond with a, I don't have this thing you're asking for, but here's this other thing that might be related that you might be interested in. Then we get the 400s. The 400 is you messed up. Remember, all these response codes are coming from the server. So this is the server telling you, the client, um, I, you did something wrong. I can't, I can't deal with this. So 400 is just you made a bad request. I don't know what this is, but I can't deal with it. Um, 403 is uh, forbidden. You asked for something, but you do not have the credentials. You don't have the... Um, you know, username and password, you don't have something, you ask for this thing and I'm not going to give it to you. 404 is not found. You ask for a thing and I don't have it. It doesn't exist. 408 is a request timeout. Uh, I just took too long processing this thing and I'm not, I'm, I'm going to give up and, and tell you that whatever you asked for is going to take too long to give to you. So sorry, figure out something else to ask for. Um, the 400, you know, you might think of like, how can I give a bad request? Uh, if we go back to our, our Netcat example, if we just omit the host line as our header, since HTTP 1.1 requires you have a host header, if we just type in the start line and omit the host line and, and send that request uh, across, the server is going to respond with, hey, this is a bad request. HTTP 1.1 demands that you set a host header. And if you don't send one, I'm going to say this is a bad request and give you a, a 400 error in, in the response. Then we get the 500s. And this is I messed up. I'm the server. And um, yeah, I just, I don't, I, I broke. Um, you've got 500 for internal server error. Uh, this is typically when you've got web applications and you're writing Python code or Java code or something, JavaScript, PHP on the server side, and you've just got code errors. You've got a problem in your code, and when the web server tried to run your code, your code broke, and the web server's like, oh, well, internal server error. Sorry, client who is asking for this thing, but here's a 500 instead of what you asked for. We saw 501 not implemented, so this is asking for an HTTP verb that doesn't exist. So, you know, if we didn't capitalize our get or our post, um, or we sent, you know, a, a, a new HTTP verb that you know, hasn't been standardized. Um, there's a couple other ones, 502, bad gateway, 503, unavailable, 504, gateway timeout. Uh, we'll touch on these briefly when we look at load balancers and things that sit between the client and the server. There's all sorts of caching layers and load balancing layers and um, content distribution networks and stuff that can potentially sit between um, the client and the server and respond with some of these types of errors. And then we also saw our 505 HTTP version not supported. So the last thing I want to talk about is just a little bit on HTTP2. Um, 
It's a new binary method of allowing multiple requests over a single TCP socket. It's really more of a way, a change in how the protocol is implemented over the wire than how the protocol works. You're still, once you've established a HTTP2, HTTP2, HTTP2 stream, you're still sending requests and receiving responses, but they could be out of order. Um, the requests still look the same, though. Um, so there is a uh, lot of documentation on trying to explain this thing. Um, I'll put some links in the show notes for um, some links to little explainers on HTTP2. Mostly just know that it does exist and it is a thing, but largely it does not change the flow and certainly not any of the diagnostics or debugging um, tools that we've got with HTTP 1.1. Um, if you want to look f at some better pictures than, than what I can draw, uh, Mariko Kosoka has a really nice uh, draw splainer of HTTP 1 and HTTP 2. Um, and there's a Twitter link that I'll put also in the show notes. So that is the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Um, it's really one of these foundational pieces of the web and web development that I think is really important to understand. It's this glue that holds together uh, so many of the other different pieces of, of the web and web technologies that we're gonna be talking about. So it's this thing that allows so many different types of clients to talk to so many different types of servers. The clients don't have to be web browsers. They can be other servers, other applications mobile apps, uh, just about anything can speak HTTP these days and be able to send and retrieve information over the internet. And one of the reasons why I, I like to talk about HTTP is that it's so useful in figuring out what's going wrong. And one of the things that you'll discover very quickly as you get into web development and web programming is that things break all the time. You make mistakes, the servers aren't quite the way that you think they are, and one of the first tools that I always reach for is, let's look at the request. What did the browser send to the server? What did the server send back? Did the server respond with a 404 that says, hey, you asked for a thing, but I don't have it. Maybe I'm asking for the wrong thing. Maybe I have a typo in one of my URLs that I'm requesting. Maybe I forgot to put that file on the server. Um, but there's a lot of information in that request and response data that can help you figure out where did I mess up? Because it's usually you messing up. Sometimes it's not you messing up. Sometimes it's actually uh, other parts that other people control. But regardless of that, this HTTP protocol and this request response data really helps you narrow in on where is something not going right. So that's most of what I wanted to talk about today with HTTP. And I hope you enjoyed it. We will talk with you next episode.